one of the things I want to talk about uh, with this panel, um, and for those of you guys who don't know me, because I haven't spoken yet today, um, I'm Amanda Tony, and I'm the managing director of Stage 32. So I oversee all of our education, and I know everybody's been talking about Stage 32 today, but I mean, obviously, it's a great resource. Um, and uh, in addition to overseeing our education, I also produce. Um, I had my first feature in theaters this year. Um, I've produced several shorts, and uh, I just sold a TV show to uh, E! Entertainment Network um, in the United States. I think that's my phone. Um, so I, I just wanted to kind of give you guys an introduction. And you guys have all introduced yourself, so I don't want to be redundant on that. Um, so today, you know, originally we had set up this panel to talk about how to run your uh, your set smoothly, and I'm telling you, you girls kicked ass in the last panel talking about crew positions, and, and you, know, you guys really hit a lot of the things that I was hoping to cover on this panel. So I'm going to switch this up slightly. It's still going to be how to, to run your set smoothly, but one thing that I think that um, has kind of come up in all the conversations today is that, you know, we all have some really crazy stuff that happens when we're shooting, you know, and, you know, sometimes you just don't know how to get out of it. And so, uh, you know, these three have been through so many uh, sets and so many issues. And so I'm just going to kind of bring up a um, kind of like a laundry list of questions of common things that happen for filmmakers on set. And I'd love for all of the ladies here to give their experiences on, on how they've dealt with it on their various productions. So we're going to switch it slightly, but I think it's going to be pretty informative for you guys. Sound good? Yeah? All right. Let's do it. Give me a second here. And on cue, sirens. <laughs> I ordered those, too. I know. You did so good at that. Um, OK. So one of the things that we've been talking about today is, you know, obviously, holding for sound. Hold the roll. Wait for sound. <laughs> You know, a lot of things we were talking about here, and especially in the Trinidad area, you know, you're dealing with small crews, and a lot of people are holding a lot of, wearing multiple hats on set. Um, you know, when you have a pole position, you know, or a key position on one of these smaller sets, you know, sometimes it's hard to give up um, control, because I, you know, I think we all think we can do it all ourselves. So can you guys give some tips or some advice on how to delegate? Well, I think that um, to start, if you hire people that trust is really, really important. So when you're going through the crewing up process, if you're hiring people that you ultimately believe in and trust, that gives you a layer of, I think, giving you the ability to actually delegate and feel good about it. But you know, you just have to remember, you can't hold everything in your brain. And pre-production is a really good time for you to kind of go through the list of, what is it that I can hand off because I can't do it all? And the truth is if I try to do it all and I don't take everything that's been in my brain for the last five years while developing this project and hand it over to something, uh, someone else, I am going to sabotage my own, my own film because I cannot possibly do everything. So I always like try to remember myself that and in prep, like actually make a laundry list of things, give away the things that I don't like to do or that I'm not the best at and make sure I delegate them ahead of time to the person on set. And then remind myself, oh, no, you've already said that anything that deals with X is going to go towards you know, this person. Because again, like we've been talking about, if you do that and prep in the moment, you're not necessarily going to have the bandwidth to actually decide who's going to take these things off your plate. But if you do it in prep, um, and you remind yourself, even if it's a list of like, okay, that person's doing that, every time it comes up, I need to make sure that I, I give it to them. I think prep would be like one like one bit of advice I'd give is do it in prep. Anybody else? Um, in terms of the delegation, prep is really good. Um, being able to copy persons on correspondences. So a lot of times you might want to, let's say as the AD, want to talk to the director about something with wardrobe, or let me phrase it, if wardrobe wants to talk to the director in an email, copy, um, you know, you might copy the AD in t to be involved, um, so that we can at least still see what's happening. Um, and I guess even in the delegation, it helps that everybody still knows what's happening. Um, as minuscule as you might think it is, once the AD is still aware of it, um, it still helps the production once we're filming. Um, so in terms of delegation as well, um, again, trust the person that you're hiring. 
um, and uh, definitely maybe have a few meetings with them in advance. So I would sit and kind of talk with the person, maybe go through a job description. We'll do a checklist. So we'll say, okay, you do this, I'll do this, we'll handle this, no, you're good at that, you do that. Same, same like what um, she's saying. So that really helps, especially on the low budget projects, yeah. Well, and I, I think too, like right before you, is it the day before you do your big production meeting yes. with all of the heads of all yes. your departments and you walk through the script and sometimes you do it in the order of, if you already have the, the film scheduled out, you sit there and you either do it by script, so page one to 100, or some people choose to go through a script um, based in the order that you've scheduled it, which as we all know, you rarely shoot a movie in the actual order of the script. And that's an opportunity for everybody to sit at that table and say, go scene by scene, you know, and deal in that, in that moment, everything that needs to be handled, any concerns that you have, and that's a meeting and an opportunity for you then to make sure that, that um, everybody knows who's handling what and everyone's able to get their concerns out. So I think that that pre-production meeting is like super important. Do you have, have trouble delegating? Well, well, it's different. I mean, as the director, you are not, that's not my job to delegate. So, I mean, I always laugh when I think about delegating. It's like the too many chiefs, not enough Indians uh, <laughs> phrase that, you know, it's it's good to be, and I, and I take that because I just follow orders. Usually it's like, Liz, you have a meeting here, you have a meeting here, you have a meeting here, you're doing this. Like my, my job as a director is scheduled um, until I show up and I'm on set. So I just sort of follow orders <laughs> at that point. Definitely follow orders. But that's because your production team has taken care of all the details exactly. that you don't have exactly. to worry about exactly. it. Exactly. I don't, I don't, that is not my, if, if I'm starting to really concern myself, unless I'm like acting as a line producer and a director, then we're having some challenges. Uh, the one thing I don't know if you went over with, with your crew and stuff is to, to be able to delegate well and before you're hiring the crews, obviously you vet the crew. You got the people you don't know. You're going to call people who've worked with them or find out anybody who's worked with them. What are they like? Da, da, da. How is that gaffer? You know, the, any cinematographer who's hiring crew always calls other people, what's that AC to like work like, you know? And you people tell you because they want the real deal as well. They want the honest truth because once you're, you know, it's the worst thing to fire somebody. I mean, it really is not something we want to do. It really disrupts the the engine a bit and then it takes a minute to get on track um, uh, so yeah, so at that point you should know your strengths this person's very anal this person likes to take smoke breaks like you, you know who to delegate to because you can sort of see what they'll fit in who's going to keep all your lists for you that um, that you shouldn't have to keep so you can be with the director and do the bigger picture huh. I'm going to throw another curveball at you. So, you know, you're, you're getting ready to direct a scene and your actor walks on set and he or she is not hair and makeup ready in the way that you envision for the scene. What do you do? Uh, we bring hair and makeup out and then we'll do it on set. Because typically if they're, we're, they're going to video wherever the, you know, um, base camp is, it's probably not anywhere near where set is and we're not going to drag them that way. No, they, they will come and they usually they, if it's the lead, if it's number one on the call sheet or number two on the call sheet, they'll come there or their assistants will be on entourage with them. But I use the, with more than number ones, I like having the, the head of the department there. And now what happens if you have an actor that shows up that perhaps, um, let's say it, they, they, it's a male actor and they're supposed to have a beard and by the night before he decides to just shave his beard um, and maybe you might have shot things earlier where he had uh, his beard. How do you handle something like that? That is going to take a minute or two to, to, to get them to fix that. No, so we, we're going to have to shoot the turnaround. We're going to have to shoot the, you know, we're going to have to shoot on some other character. But yeah, behind, exactly, the over or something. We're, That's you know. a great advice. Yeah, great so yeah. Well, and it's something that, just to piggyback on what you said, which I think is important, is t in order for a set to run smooth, you have to make sure that everything is as close as possible that might be needed in a split second. So what you were talking about is making sure the hair and makeup isn't sitting back in the room that they were prepping. They do need to come to set with the talent, if at all possible, because if you do need to do something, you don't have time for them 
to run all the way back. back. So, you know, make sure that you are thinking ahead and bringing everything that, that they might need, whether it's hair, makeup, wardrobe with you and have it there. And that's the same for equipment. Like I think with G&E, it's like, if you think you might need something, bring it off the truck and have it nearby so that you're not wasting the time to stop and have to go all the way back out to the mm -hmm. truck to get it. That's actually one of my questions. You know, on, on some of your most efficient sets, what would you say are the best and most efficient setups? I think closeness is, is huge. Having everything close enough that, I mean, I'll never forget on the, the Hallmark film that I worked on, we, so we shot actually um, at a house that had 99 stairs going all the way down to the dock on this lake. And so, you know, first they have the talent go down there and all the crew members have to go down there and we get ready to shoot the scene and this bright green boa that the actor was supposed to have they didn't have it with her. So not only did they have to go back to the trailer, they had to go up 99 stairs. Like, you can imagine this poor, you know, assistant in the wardrobe yeah, department. Everyone's watching her. Like, they're like, we don't have it. We don't know where it is. It's, it's, it's up there. <laughs> and so, I mean, it just takes time. So really, you have to think ahead. Each department is like, what might I need? And keep it close. Carts. It's time. Ah. Carts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The most important thing is, is that everybody's on carts because you just don't want to, you can then efficiently move from location to location, especially camera department needs to be on cars, not carrying cases, unpacking cases, putting cases. Mm -hmm. They need to all just sort of roll on carts, sound rolls on the car, you all roll somewhere, get there and roll somewhere else. Unless you have 99 and then, so, yeah, then, <laughs> then go up. They still will carry the carts <laughs> down because they need it, they can't just have things, especially the more expensive, you know, the better the gear, you're not going to put it on the ground or in the, trip on and and the whole thing is is even though you're moving fast especially when you're working with higher level like lenses or stuff like that like it's always I mean I don't want to grab the case you know, all, exactly when the lens you know it's they will always say you know work safely work smartly not don't mm -hmm. don't run you know all that stuff Oh, no, well, we don't have cats, but I really like that idea. <laughs> you can get them like, Amazon. Wow. You know what? Amazon. <laughs> cats are a really good idea. We normally just have to kind of, like, move with things, um, but that will make it uh, additionally efficient, which is really, really good, so I like that. On the bigger productions, you will see them. They'll normally bring in things. Um, on the international films, we'll send in containers um, of huge journey stuff, um, camera department. They will have all of their crates and cats and stuff, but I like that. I'm going to take that idea. Thank you. Um, but today, <laughs> that's really good. Also, crew, typically, even on the indies, will rent, you have to rent the cart from them. Yeah, we they'll rent the cart and yeah, they'll rent, and the, the, and the production rents that cart along with their whatever gear they're renting. Yeah. yeah. Sub renting. Great yeah. idea. Yeah. Well, and, and crew, I think, is important, too. Even if you're on, like, a super tight budget, and let's say you only have, like, one person in each department, I would say something that we always do to make it run efficiently is yeah, have, a mil have a lot of PAs because having some, just having bodies there that can run out and do an errand that are expendable, right? You can't send your script supervisor out to go get a battery or go get like a prop that you're missing. So having enough people, volunteers that are on hand to be able to run errands, to be able to run to the other side of set, to be able to stop, like stand on the street and stop traffic. I mean, I don't know if that's legal, but you know, <laughs> stop traffic, like don't walk through set because you can't be pulling somebody that is already in a position that's integral to do that. So having those extra bodies really is key. And that's always the, the the sort of thing is it's equipment versus bodies and sometimes producers think they, they want to get the equipment and then we as the crew we as the, the DP department is always like yeah but who's operating that like yeah, yeah you okay. might yeah that's that's well well good with the drone and the second camp but who's operating that yeah. well you gave me it's me and this other guy and an assistant we can't do that all it, it's time time is money like time is money and time like you Having all of that is going to keep adding on to the time, and you're not going to be as efficient in your day. Right. So if you're not stopping to have the, the director, the DP running over to get the lens or the you know something to change things up, and you've got somebody right there with it, you're saving time, and you're being more efficient, and you're making your day, and you're not going into overtime, and you know there's a spiral effect. Um, and to also add to the efficiency of the PAs or the volunteers, we would normally set up a, a few meetings before 
we start filming, so we would assign maybe two PAs to the wardrobe department, um, let them meet in advance so they have an idea of maybe the jargon, um, so that even when they're on set and you say, bring this, bring that, they're like, what is that? So they're familiar with the department, we assign them specifically to certain departments so that they can be a lot more efficient at that point in time. Yeah. Awesome. You know, this is going to be a very basic question, but I'm curious, you know, obviously an efficient production runs on the production schedule. And so when you print it out, do you guys have any tips or advice on unique places to put it? So that way people always know where it is and what time they're supposed to be places? Well, we always make like, um, God. <laughs> it's a tough question because what we'll do is we'll email it, of course, and then we'll just print maybe like the top sheet um, with the sides, so we'll have the sides attached to it, um, and then we'll give it out to the HODs um, because they're normally they're the only ones who ask for it. The other departments, they're like, we don't want that. You see it kind of resting down on the floor somewhere. So if we just give it to the HODs, and then if we, we kind of like notify them, um, by word amount. So we'll go and say, okay, in the next two hours, we'll be doing scene XYZ. Um, the prop that we need is whatever. Do you have this? Do we have that? So to just be a little more efficient, we just give them a heads up at least an hour, hour and a half in advance so that everything is on standby um, before the scene. But they don't call sheets and those things. They don't know. No. I always, I always like to have them and even like these mini versions that like nobody can read because it's like yes. a full page call sheet like condensed down to this. But I still do it so people can kind of put it in their pocket or have it on them. But I, I know back in the, the day, we would actually like just put one in the hair and makeup room and just like you could just put it on the wall or you could put it over, you know, at g and &E just so that at least you could say that you gave them the schedule, whether you can't force her to look at it, you know, or to carry it around or... Yeah. yeah. Well, I was going to say um, one great piece of advice that I had heard was to make it pocket size, mm -hmm. so that way you know people can just stick it in their mm -hmm. back pocket and check it throughout the day. They laugh at me. They're like, "Yeah, Sarah, how am I going to read this?" I'm <laughs> like, I, "I gave it to you. Okay, I did my job." <laughs> Attach it to the lanyard, so I'll have a, maybe like a bulldog. Oh, that's, that's a great idea. So I'll just kind of have it right there, so I can just look at it the same half size. So I'm looking at it right here, and then I mark it off. So it's always on me like this. Great yeah. tip, great tip. Yeah. And then another tip I had heard as well is to post it in the bathroom as well, <laughs> on the back of, you know, on the yeah, back of the, door like of the bathroom. <laughs> so that way no one has an excuse not being where they need to be. Wow. I'm supposed um, to be somewhere right now. Great. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to happen. 10 one. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. So now let's talk about this, and I know that everybody's experienced this. Can you give some advice when you start going over schedule? Got to make decisions. Got to prioritize. Yeah. Let's give some specifics and let's give some examples too from films that you're commercials or anything that you've worked on. Like what do you actually yeah, like, do when you get to that point? Um, I mean, you're, you're going to know far ahead of time that you're getting, you're, you're, you're right after lunch, you know, you know, doomsday is coming. Um, and, and so you're already, I mean, your lunch usually is about having is meetings. Correct. You're usually having meetings at lunch about how are we going to deal with the fact that the actor didn't show up for two hours or whatever the thing may be. So um, the set keeps running. It's just in the, it's like a background hum that happens. It feels like there's decisions that are happening and you keep directing and things are happening over here and then they'll finally be like, okay, this is what, what do you think? You know, it just is. You sort of go with the flow. You're not stopping work. Yeah, you just keep working, and then you know, and then you also depends what day it is, and are we pushing things to other days, or can we, you know, it's it's a bigger, I think, global yeah. question than that day. Correct, because um, I wanted to say by lunchtime you'll kind of know if you're gonna make a day. So we're either deciding if we're gonna push or go extra. Um, what is second meal? So now we're studying how mm -hmm. much money we have to spend now on food. Um, can we afford overtime? How will that impact, impact the call time for the next day based on turnaround? So right. there's a lot of, uh, that's a huge issue. Um, especially what, what if it's like day one of filming that's going to throw up your entire schedule. Um, you might even need to do like a, a day now, a down day to, to get back your proper turnaround or just a lot mm -hmm. of different things. So. You, you pray for that not to happen, but if it does, it's really going to change the entire um, scope. It, it's in, yeah. it's, especially <laughs> if you're looking at days where you're, you need daylight. Like, if you start pushing and the next day you start later and later, at the end of the week you have five hours of, of daylight and you need 
another four or five that you would count it on at the beginning of the schedule. So it really is a trickle down effect. But you know, as a producer, I usually that's when I start to internally freak out. I'm like, oh no, we need to make decisions. We need to cut things. But that's where I start going through the checklist of like. You know, sometimes I'll pull the director aside and say, you know, mm-hmm. let's. This is the reality of what we have. Like, we're running out of time, and I only have the crane or whatever specialty equipment this day. Mm-hmm. What is it that you want to get? We can, if you want to, you know, get the crane one more day. Then that means we're going to have to lose another. I call them toys. You know, mm-hmm. another toy <laughs> later on in production. Yes. So the producer really has to be able to think of like. Where can I swap financially? If this Mm -hmm. is going to cost us more money because we only have equipment for one day or we need it for two days or we need to hire an actor for Mm -hmm. bringing them in for another day, like how is that going to affect the overall budget? And you just have to, I think when you start, you you don't want to tell people as a producer, I don't like to tell people what to do. I like to give them options and let the team collectively make a decision based on the priorities of the, the collective team. And again, it goes back to if you all have that same vision, then the answer becomes very clear, but you do have to start like making decisions and prioritizing mm-hmm. at that point. And it's a conversation with the director. It actually comes back to uh, the first panel that we started to kick off the conference. It really kind of also comes down to story. Mm-hmm. You know, every great project comes down to the story, and it's you know when you do have to kill your darlings, those are real. That's real problems right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, so you have to realize, like you said, here's some solutions, and let's definitely try and and make. The, we need to maintain the story, and what could we lose? It's it's a big big deal for mm-hmm. for you when you're on set. Um, so now another common thing that I'm sure a lot of people come up with is if you might be missing an actor um, when they are supposed to be on set. I haven't had that as much. I can probably. Um, it depends on if it's uh, number one on the call sheet. Mm-hmm. I actually, I can give a really good example. Uh, it was a major film locally, and of course it's number one on the call sheet. Uh, he's supposed to be at a location, but when we call now, of course, for the celebrities and they, they have an assistant. As 80s, that need to be a best friend. The assistant to the number one, you and that person should be like this. So that when we're, cause as a second lady, I have to call and be like, where's so-and-so? And be on our way. You never want them to say, we're on our way. Tell me exactly where you are so we can time it and be like, you know what? They're going to be late, so let's do a scene. Let's push this. Talk to all of the head of departments. We need to move scenes. So are you ready? Da, 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 da. Mm-hmm. Then we'll talk to the director, make sure that they're ready for that scene. It's just a lot. And um, that day, the <laughs> number one on the call sheet was 19 minutes away. And we were already waiting um, at least an hour because they were saying we're on our way. So we had to actually now. So that's when I took it. Well, the AD, the first and I were communicating. And when they finally became, well, told us the truth, we were able to say, okay, let's prep for scene X where everyone now had to be ready for that. So we were able to still do something else until number one arrived. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I think that's key is you can't tie, time is money. You're on a tight schedule. You can't stand there and wait for them. Correct. You really have to go, okay, can we do the reverse? Mm -hmm. Can we, you know, just shoot out, can we shoot out the other actor in the scene? Is there Mm -hmm. a way that the director can pull that off? I mean, we had a situation where the first day that a young child was shooting, um, I got called to the trailer because the mother was kind of having a breakdown about us cutting his hair. And it was a period piece, so we had to cut it. But they're like, um, Sarah, we need you in the makeup, hair and makeup trailer. <laughs> and they're like, okay, it's gonna be great. And literally, like, I, I, it took time because she'd never cut his hair, and it was his baby hair, and like, it was a thing. And um, so we, they, um, they reversed, they cut, they shot as much of the scene as they could um, without him just doing mm-hmm. um, like his POV and stuff. And then we were able to, um, you know, get him on set. But the, the key is you have to do something. Correct. Usually. Yes. <laughs> so but if you've planned and you have like your storyboards and you know what to do, it's, right. it's probably yeah. easier yeah. to go do that than totally, it's totally. all up here. The worst is the crew standing around. Correct. The minute they start standing around for, it's fine for the first 10 minutes, but after that, you lose them. So you totally lose them and they start working slower and slower and they just, to get that momentum back, Correct. Yeah. it's hard. Now, I want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, obviously the director and actor relationship is key. Mm-hmm. If you're having trouble with your talent, you know, maybe you're not getting the right performance out of them, or maybe they're just difficult on set, can you give some tips? Well, <laughs> how much time do we have? Well, I mean, 
And as, as 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 you grow as a human, you learn more how to deal with with babies on set who are, become you know. I mean, you're so diplomatic. It's it is it is um, it is a challenging and and I'm more of the. Um, I mean, you, you you just have to. It's just like dealing with an irritated child. So you have to try. You try just different methods. There's no one method that's gonna work for every kid. So, you know, coddle them or boost them up or take a little walk around or do this. Or, and sometimes you just have to be outright. You no, know, we're fucking doing the scene fucking right now. <laughs> you know, you friggin' sign your t- contract and you sign your NDA. You get out. You know, like whatever the fuck. So sometimes you just have to like lay it out because like. Uh, it just is absurd. They're hired to do a gig. Like that's their job. They came in to do a job. This is a job. It's not like, you know, it's, it's, there's not really room for that. Um, I think it's it is being an actor is a very vulnerable, intense thing. But you also are signing up for it, mm-hmm. and we're all grown ups and we're making something. And so I, th- you you try to avoid that from the get go. And as we talked before, you would you'll get air of it from the hair and makeup you'll, you're going to understand there's shit going down um, and then how you you sort of guide that to the thing uh, but I don't think there's a there's one way to approach it so you're almost like a therapist you're always a therapist you're always a therapist 24-7 well I and I feel that because I've actually had to have that conversation because sometimes it's difficult, I think, for the director to have to have some conversations, right? Because that is such an important relationship. So there's times where I have noticed things and I always take someone offset in a way that no one knows I'm taking them offset, but those are conversations that don't need to happen in front of the other crew. Like, I get really disappointed in crew members that have piece of advice. a conversation in front of everyone. Like, do you know, and that's going to make it even worse because you're embarrassing them Mm -hmm. and um, it's going to escalate. So I always, like I've had to do it with crew members and I've had to do it with talent. It's like I just nonchalantly slip into the trailer and I'm like, hey, you know, and sometimes I'll take it, even if like the director comes to me and there's a problem, like I'll still make it about like, hey, I noticed this, what's going on? And, And then I'll kind of, it's like a therapy session, but sometimes there's ways to deal with it that is not as combative that you're getting the point across and you can let them vent something that then just, Mm -hmm. and I think, I think that dealing with it is key because as it starts to boil and the longer you let things go, whether it's a crew member or a cast, it's just going to get worse and worse and snowball and it's going to be more difficult to deal with. But I think if at the beginning in the first couple of days you set the expectations of what they can and cannot do and what you're expecting, that I've seen people that were super difficult in the second they like know what's going to be tolerated and what's not in a very nice way, like they change and then everything's smooth sailing. But you don't have that conversation until day 20 on a 30-day shoot. Whew, good luck. Mm -hmm. because you've let them get away with it. No, quick question for you. Have you ever noticed, um, you know, we're obviously talking about talent or, you know, crew that might, um, we have an issue with. um, Have you ever noticed or have you been on a project where the director has lost control of the set? Or never had control. Or never had control. (laughs) How do you handle that? Do tell. Do tell. No, I'm curious. um, You know, it's difficult because now your job as a producer is less about producing and you're waiting for your job is to make sure a ticking time bomb does not go off because if it goes off, then it's going to affect the entire crew. And it's a very difficult position. Um, I've pulled that person aside and had conversation after conversation. Unfortunately, it gets to a point if you're so far into the shoot, you have no choice but to give them. But what does that look like when they're not delivering, I guess? What is it? Someone who is insisting upon things that they know, you know, are not in your budget. They are berating people in front of the whole crew mm. and and uh, asserting their their authority in a way that is demeaning. And you've got crew members are about to break down. And and in that case too, sometimes you have to focus you focus on that person, but you also have to remember the trickle down that that director is affecting everyone on set. So I would have to go to every department. And you're you're doing a great job. I see what you're doing. I understand that this is difficult. I have your back. If you do have any problems, please come see me. We're going to do everything we can to get you through this and give you all the tools. And I, and I apologize that you're in this position. Mm-hmm. But I, I, you have to, you can't ignore the fact that that trickle down is affecting everyone. Yeah. And if you acknowledge it, then they are going to be on your team to know, okay, we're all in this 
mm -hmm. together. Um, but it's I don't I don't wish that on anyone. <laughs> I'm. I can probably speak to two examples. Um, one, if the director is insisting on doing a take maybe for five hours, and you're trying <laughs> to tell the director. I mean, sometimes it might be a crucial shot, but sometimes it's not. And a lot of times you're like, you're doing this for X amount of time. I'm like, yes, but we need this shot, it's important. It's not based on we spoke to, you know, when you when you really see the essence of it, um, or it's a very labor intensive scene, one director did the scene 15 times, and was just a movement from point A to point B, and it was the same setup 15 times. And when you're trying to say, they're lifting this heavy thing 15 times. They didn't want to stop. Um, and then what happens is that they want to push lunch. They don't want to notify before, because you know you have to break for lunch. And the director's insisting, no, um, we're going over time. We're going to push lunch. And you're like, but we need to communicate with the HODs. We need to tell people that, you know, if we have to push. And a lot of times when the director is not listening, just to, to have a heart a little bit, you see the crew kind of feeling jaded. Um, they get really upset. They start coming to work late. So now that's affecting this core time. It just affects everything because they realize uh, this director is not listening at all, you know? It's also too, yeah, there's, that's someone that's just, some people are difficult just to be difficult or that's their personality and you can't change it, right? So you're stuck with it. But then it's also understanding where they're coming from because it worked with the directors that like this is their story and they lived it. And so while it seems like they're being difficult, they're like, well, now the jacket that I was wearing was a different texture. It looks like this, yes, but nope, I need something that's, that's heavier. Mm -hmm. And you're like, but understanding where they're coming from and, and sharing that with the crew, like, listen, you know, this is their story. This is why it's, why they're being difficult. Mm -hmm. it, it, it allows you to, the understanding anything, I think, allows oh. you to accept oh. it. And yeah, it's it. interesting from the, uh, in one of the I'm webinars that yeah. I did, uh, no, I we, had a, we had a producer who, he's produced 80 films over the last two years. He's prolific, eight, eight zero. He's prolific. And he has a really interesting method he actually has a backup director. A backup. He actually has a backup director. So he, he people that are that he knows that love the script that are like are completely invested in the script. So given at any point if something were to fall out, that he just stays engaged with them and will swap them out on set. But it's crazy. Well, which is why I said those two things. It is top down from the director, the vibe on the set, as I said before. And two, as a director, if you're on like an indie, if you can get the producer credit get the producer credit, credit. the directors are expendable, they are hired guns as well, unless, you know, you get the producer credit, then you cannot be shoved off the project, whether it's something you wrote, you know. Yeah. But I also think there is this, there is a reality, what, what, sorry, Elizabeth was right, it, there is a method to some madness. It's, uh, the bigger example would be David Fincher and his bazillion takes and being yeah. obsessive compulsive about that, which he's going for something very sick, only he sees in his head, or Christian Bale who's yelling at everybody, but it is distracting him when he's deep into a part to have like people on their phones laughing and showing pictures to each other deep in the set. You know, like there is to get a high quality, lo you just have to know what type of cat you're working with. Yeah. And usually that type of cat brings a sort of precision, uh, perfectionist team with them. Sure. You know, and they get, and every, and then everybody is sort of working on that weirdo an, anal level, but, but then we get it and then we sort of enjoy it. Um, That's what you strive for. Right, and, cause, and it, is, it is, once it's done, once you move on from that scene, you're not coming back. I mean, you're not Woody Allen who gets to go and like redo this, you know, God willing, we would love to do that because you see, you see the dailies and you're like, okay, but this is actually how it should go. Now we should do a reshoot or, you know, but we don't have the luxury of that. Definitely. Now, one of the things that this, uh, this last question that kind of touched upon is sometimes negativity creeps into a set. It could be because of, uh, a, you know, a, a crew member, or it could be maybe someone's pissed off at a piece of news that they read on their phone in between takes. How do you keep people inspired, motivated, um, when things start to turn negative on set? <laughs> Who wants to take this one? Well, I was, I'll tell you about a circumstance I got in. Um, we talked earlier about hair, makeup, and wardrobe. Like, not only are they the place that you, know, you want the actors to feel comfortable because they're so vulnerable, but it also can be a breeding ground for gossip, mm -hmm. and it sets the tone for like, 
that department is like, yeah, well, production did this and yeah. production did that, and this, and it, yeah. it like it, it that they leave there and they they bring it to set. And I was, um, it was very low budget, so we literally had like a construction trailer that we had like split in half. So like this half was like a makeshift hair and makeup, and this half was wardrobe. And I had to go into wardrobe like some to get something, and I went in, and so the other side is hair and makeup, and nobody knew I was on the wardrobe side. And I catch wind of what's going on with hair and makeup and going, you know, we had just had a scene, and um, we did not change the schedule, but when the talent came out, they were in the wrong, um, was it, it the, their hair was done different. Like, they were supposed to be in, like, a ponytail or a braid or something. So they went back to hair and makeup to, to prep them for the right scene. And they're, well, production, they would just stop changing things. I mean, they just completely changed the call sheet. And, you know, we were, like, in other words, saying we were right and we had you prepped, but they just changed things. And it was like, oh, no, 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 no. And so I heard all this. And first of all, I'm like, this negativity and gossip, like, I need to put a stop to it now. And so that was a conversation I had to have later. But then I also, like, nonchalantly went into the trailer and I was like, you know, hi, how are things doing? I just want to make sure you guys have the schedule because, you know, we're, we're yeah, staying by yeah. it today. And I kind of pulled it out and, like, I had to, you have to stick yes. up for production because right. they always throw production mm-hmm. under yes. the bus. But yeah. those yes. are also the people that it's, like, our reputation <laughs> that we hired them and brought them there. And Correct. you don't want to, like, give us a bad name. So, like, you somebody have to step in and, like, in a very nonchalant way, be mm-hmm. like, you were wrong. Like, yeah, here's a schedule. Are there any problems? Because obviously, you know, we've been staying by the schedule so far. Like, but, like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, how do you call Endorsed. It? Um, I, I agree with you. I have, in terms of negativity, um, it's I've, the only situation where I've been in with that is that um, where maybe a lot of times it's really the director. They have a lot of issues with maybe how the director is communicating or not communicating. So in terms of that, the crew will actually now detach themselves from the director. And now they'll side and say, well, you know, um, if he wants overtime or she wants overtime, we ain't doing that. And they start to now say they're not doing it. Um, And if it's, and if we're overhearing and we're saying, okay, I will kind of go to them individually and say, okay, let's talk, what's wrong? Um, And then at the end of the day, if the director wants to hear it, I can say, listen, let's, maybe, you know, maybe at the top of the day, let's maybe talk to them, say what's happening, let's all be on the same page. Um, Let them know that they're valuable, say something nice, have a meeting, do something. Um, And it's up to the director to do that. If they don't, then they're kind I'm trying to say, well, you want to save the production. Um, And it's, it kind of goes, it it really falls on the lap of the director if they want to. And I've seen it where when the director refused to do that, um, the crew just refused to support. Mm-hmm. Refused. Like, mm-hmm. we're not doing it. It, it. You're there to work, but you also want to make sure people are having fun. And I think that that's the key. So, like, if the morale is down because it's hot or they're working long hours and that's where the ne- negativity is, we're like, we've surprised people and brought on, like, coolers of ice cream, you know, mm-hmm. like, and gone out and it's like ice cream day. Hey, guys, we're going to take a break. Here's a surprise. On the bigger films, they bring in, like, Starbucks trucks and stuff, but we do have coolers of, you know, popsicles <laughs> and, and ice cream. But, like, it's doing little things or, like, sometimes we'll do, like, at lunch, we'll do a raffle and or give out an award or, or you know, thank a crew member or be yeah, like, hey, yeah. tomorrow we're going to, you know, do um, camo day. So wear camouflage and, like, mm-hmm. you have contests mm-hmm. and keep the morale up. And if you notice they're down, like, you got to step in and make it fun and, and recognize people and kind of get that vibe on set because yeah. once we had a set where you know there was this I didn't, I heard about it uh, after it had kind of gotten really bad where there was this talk about overtime and how people weren't going to get paid overtime yeah. and there were PAs that weren't because some people had contracts that you know we were talking earlier about keeping everyone very very streamlined mm-hmm. on well, this case mm-hmm. they had given overtime to the some Certain. of the crew but not other uh-huh. ones mm-hmm. and it became this like talk 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 negative negative and. Um, that's when you want to keep the the morale up and just completely shift it and make it fun. And yeah, I love that. And it, it's just it's those little things like the popsicles after a 15 hour day can go so far. You know, exactly. just the little things and and just the, the the pleasantries. You know, just like keeping them great job. You know, just Jane, nice. you're doing a great yeah. job. You know, we couldn't afford to give meal penalties, but we had, on two days had to go over on meals and they were working mm-hmm. late. And so we figured out like who drank beer and who would drink wine, and it cost us like. Six ninety nine for a six pack of beer. So at the end of the day, when everyone wrapped, we gave everyone that drank beer like a six pack. It was six ninety nine as opposed to like right. the overtime, yeah. and just said, "Hey, here, you guys, thank you." And that goes such a long mm-hmm. way. That helps. We also do the beers. We call them the penguins on ice. 
um, if it's a difficult location, if it was maybe somewhere that's really awful stenched, or if it was a lot of walking, um, at the end of the day, you'll get beers, you'll get whatever you have, and then they like that. They line, they hang out a bit, and they're ready to come again because, you know, we said thank you in some way that, you know, I mean, the crew likes the alcohol, so after after always <laughs> um, all right so another thing that comes up is sometimes you have stunts you know or some some sort of uh, kind of action part of a script what happens if a stunt goes wrong hmm. they usually do <laughs> <laughs> at least the first couple takes <laughs> well as long as no one gets hurt yeah, I mean yeah. but if a stunt goes wrong you just have to re-engineer you know that's because no one you haven't done it before obviously and um, it's literally just re-engineering it and, and you know, stunts take a while. What, what if it starts to eat up hours and eating up part of the day? And just sort of, I think you plan for that. I think you're already planning. It depends how difficult it is. I think it's already, they're never going to go off immediately. But sometimes you have, if it's not working, it's like we well, have to reimagine the scene yeah. maybe. And mm -hmm. okay, so maybe we're going to hear that explosion and, and not see it. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are times where you get to a breaking point where you're like, okay, we scheduled this amount of time and we were we were wrong. Or the stunt's just not, for some reason, the special effect is not working right. as it should. Mm -hmm. And and that happens. And I mean, we did have a scene where we did an explosion in a cave and we weren't getting the effect, like the way the director wanted to shoot it, like we weren't getting the debris and the effects mm -hmm. exactly that uh, she wanted. So she had to kind of reimagine how she was gonna shoot it so she could shoot it at an angle that it actually looked bigger than what we, we had to provide. Or you shoot a piece of it and then you're like, okay, let's let's stop and shoot a piece and then we're going to do this other day when we're doing this light load, we're going to try it from this thing because then, and then you have people all go home and they scratch their heads a lot and then they come up with the idea of how to do it <laughs> properly and you try to pick it up at another time. And sometimes there are, there are little miracles where something goes wrong and you're like, oh, well actually that was really realistic. That was really I mean, cool. no one's hurt, yeah. but like that actually looks cool. Yeah. And if, if you're open-minded to, you know, <laughs> how it all goes down. Yeah. Now how about on-set romance? Oh, oh God. <laughs> what about it? <laughs> Doesn't that always happen? What's the question exactly? Yeah, is, there, is, is, that, is, is there a question with that? <laughs> how do you deal with it? You know, if people are, are you know, going off in twosomes and they might, uh, be late for shoots or you know that's causing friction between the, the cast and the crew I don't think it causes friction yeah. I don't think they're late I don't think I mean yeah. especially when you're doing union I mean you guys are new but I mean, everybody runs by union rules and, and you, no one's late to set is just not like you know you're gonna get fired if you're late to set so um, I don't think it ever usually they're grown-ups and they're doing you know it's normal part of the especially when you're on track you know way shoots if you want to get town. married and you're looking, come to one of my sets because we've had several onset romances that have actually turned into relationships <laughs> oh that are still going strong. Well, and, and uh, unfortunately, some of them have been a result of ending a relationship and starting <laughs> divorces too. So maybe I shouldn't right. forget it. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, we've had we've been matchmaker. Um, now, what happens if you're in the middle of shooting and you are over budget? I think it goes back to your answer earlier about the schedule. It's like you know, you get to a point where you know it's going to be an issue, and you, the the biggest problem you have is if you're not monitoring the budget. Like as a line producer, I learned that every day look, make sure that you have an accountant if you can, someone that is tracking the expenses, and you can literally look at exactly where you are, so you could start to make the decisions that you need to ahead of time and swapping expenses so that you're not because you don't have a choice. Now, if we had Hurricane Sandy, which I mentioned earlier, and I mean, that was a solid $50,000 that we didn't expect and we did not get an insurance claim. I think somebody earlier was talking about being able to call insurance. We didn't. And I mean, and in that case, um, if you are actually working with money and you have a budget, I always write into my agreement that if we run into the situation that those natural disasters happen, that you would not... Uh, count on or unexpected that you can go back to your investors and ask for them to contribute 10% of what they originally put in. So like we have had in contracts, if we run into that situation, you could do a capital call 
and each investor ahead of time has agreed that they will put in an diff- additional 8% or 10% that you're able to call in that situation. Um, we did run into that situation once, and it was because we were supposed to be non-union, and when we found out that one of our stars, based on our history, would not cross a picket line, and if there were any issues, like we were gonna lose that actor, and time is of the essence, we decided in the last minute that we were gonna have to go union, which is a, is a problem I know in the States that you guys don't have. Yeah. So we were able to, to call on that cause and um, collect more money to deal with it. All right, guys. Well, we're gearing up towards the end, so I want to open it up for questions unless you guys had any last-minute pieces of advice. Any more horror stories? Uh, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, no. Well, does anybody have any questions? Do you guys have any questions? questions? It is. Oh, well, I can. Hi. Uh, just to follow up on what you were saying, Sarah. So you, it's, it's contractual. It's in the contract when you go back to them for this eight to ten yeah, percent, a- and they're just cool with that. Well, they've agreed to it when they. No, now I'm talking about if you have a budget of. I guess you could do it on any budget level, and I'm not remembering the exact percentage that's in our contract, but I know like on a on like a two million dollar budget or so, like we were able to get like another hundred and fifty thousand dollars that we were able to call. It's a capital call. And then, so they've, they've already technically agreed to do it, and you go back and you pull it. Mm-hmm. So this is all in the, or, the original arrangements when you know, when you go into them, or these are, these are investors you've been, you've dealt with before? It, it's in your operating agreement, so what they sign when they actually contribute the money as to, here are the terms of the money that you're mm-hmm. giving us, this is what you're agreeing to do, this is how you're gonna get paid back. It's, it, it's not always in the document, I added it. Like, I tend to believe that when you're doing your, your documents, you should assume the worst case scenario and make sure that there's you're covered in that case. Like, in our documents, too, like, on a $3 million film, we technically, I don't want to get into to, to in the weeds, but, you know, what if X happens? Do you have the ability to, to account for it? Like, what if you have to suddenly your film is up like an indie hit and it could be up for an, an Oscar and now you have to um, do an Oscar campaign. Right. Like, do you have the money to do it? No. And our contracts, while we say we're only able to raise, let's say you're raising half a million dollars or a million dollars for your film, in our contract it says, you know, if, if in the instance that we need another double that budget in order to do a campaign of some kind, we have the opportunity to go raise more money. So in other words, like this contract is, is no longer capped at what we originally thought and we can go raise more money. Now, I've never had to use it, mm-hmm. but like if, if, if we're up for an Oscar and we don't have the money to actually, you know, go through like sending people the, the screeners and actually promoting it, like Getting we're publicists. kicking ourselves. So like I always just think ahead of like, what are the worst case scenarios? I think a capital call is a way if you actually are dealing with a budget to protect yourself. But your goal is to recognize it ahead of time so that you don't earn over budget. You're noticing on day five out of a 15 day shoot that, you, that you're, you're um, going, because it, it, it doesn't, it's not goodwill to go back to the investors and say, hey, we need it because we screwed up and we didn't budget. It's easier to go and say, hey, get, there's a hurricane <laughs> and we kind of didn't plan on this. So we might need extra money or you know, we have to go union, so. And um, last thing, are there any, I don't know, stories that you have with regards to dealing with an investor that um, maybe didn't go the way you wanted it to go? Uh, a re- return on investment or, or something like that? Um, I think it's important in your contracts with investors to not give them any creative control. They, they are backing your project from a financial standpoint. And um, you know, if someone is wanting to have a say in any of your creative, that's where it, I, most of the time you find that investors can be very, very difficult. So I would definitely advise on that. And um, you know, it's funny, if you're dealing with investors that do this on a regular basis, and they're usually the ones that give you the larger amounts of money, I, even if you haven't gotten them their money back, I never hear from them. It's the ones that really couldn't afford to do it that maybe gave you one tenth of what all the other ones are giving you. Those are the ones that um, I get the calls like, "So we're gonna get our money back? You know, uh, can I can I get can I just sell my share? I don't want to be a part of it anymore." And I'm like, "You put in like one tenth of what all these other investors. These other investors are putting in like a quarter of a million dollars, 
and your $25,000 share, like I have to deal with this. So you know, it's another reason to not be you know, like, don't beg people for money because they might end up being really, really difficult to work with. The people that are used to investing, just they, it's a, it's a, what did somebody say? It's a trip to the, to the um, casino for him. He's like, this is like Vegas. You know, here's my money. I know it's a risk. It's a gamble. You know, you never hear from him. But do you go straight to the investors or through like the financial advisor or something or like a friend? You mean to, to raise to the money? The money, yeah. Do you go directly to the money or do you go like through like the six degrees of separation? I mean, or ultimately, regularly? you want to talk to the person. And you know, I think, in my opinion, your investors are just like crewing up. Like, I have said no to investors' money because I knew that they were going to be difficult. There was a guy that was ready to hand me a check, and his wife was kind of weird. Like, he was weird with me as a female, and she was really, really difficult. And he was trying to, like, tell me how to make the film and really got too far in to my business just in our first couple meetings. And so when he finally made the offer and was like, yeah, I want to be involved, I had to call him and say, um, you know what, I, I just I don't think that this is the best partnership and I, I turned the money down and I also had a situation where in my first film there were brokers they, got, they essentially wanted to broker it you know they never dealt with film before but they were excited about the economic development impact and I would have had the entire amount to make our movie and I took a whole nother year to raise money for the film because I turned their money down because they were um, going to compromise the integrity and what we had told the one investor this is a million dollars they were going to give us I had one investor on for 50000 and everybody else I had talked to, I was very um, adamant about how we were going to run this. And they wanted to change it and take more money towards them, but they thought we were going to have our entire budget. And I was like, no, I'm not going to go back on my word to people. There's a certain integrity that I'm going to have. No, thank you. And I took a whole another year. And I, but I, I knew had I, had I taken any of those those investors on in both cases, it would have changed the way enti the entire film ran. And I wouldn't have been happy with it. So in those cases, you have to make those decisions in the same way of crewing up. You're in bed with them. You, you, they are along for the ride. So if there's a personality conflict or they're, they're going to give you a hard time, it's not worth it, even if it's the money. Sorry, do you guys? All right, I wanted to just track back to the conversation with um, set and scheduling, but I'm, I'm gonna ask a question first. Uh, I know you keep talking about Polaroids and getting, <laughs> like you're forgetting the, 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 the digital age, but uh, considering how attached people are to their mobile devices, do you all generally have a caveat where people aren't allowed to bring mobile devices on set or in the general vicinity, like you block them from accessing a certain point? with a mobile device, you know, like there's some breaches that have happened in Hollywood where people are using mobile devices and leaking certain scenes or things like that, but what is, the, what is your best practice, your common practice? And then I'll come back to the question. Yeah. Uh, well, for us on the call sheet, we'll either say no photography. Um, in the contract, we'll also say don't do that. Um, I, I think when they see it in the contract as well, they feel like, ooh, the serious yeah. boy, right? Um, definitely every day it repeats on the call sheet. And uh, on set, we still say, um, just guys, no photos, especially when like extras come. Extras can be very like risky. Extras, you have to pay real attention to. Mm -hmm. um, maybe the extras, depending on the scene, you say no phones. Um, but uh, other than that, I've never had a situation where uh, they compromised it. If you do feel like it's a risk, tell them to remove to move the phones from the space. Um, sometimes I was in a production where we had to log in our phones, seal it in a bag, write your name, put the phone aside. So it depends. Okay. I'm actually going to add a uh, an alternative opinion to that. Um, I don't know if you were here for the crowdfunding panel yesterday. Yes. Were, okay, so we were talking about crowdsourcing and how important it is as an independent filmmaker to build your own audience. Um, I think as you related, some of the, the larger Hollywood movies, obviously you can't leak videos of like Leonardo DiCaprio on set, you know. But for independent films, um, we've actually used it a completely different way where we encouraged phones on set. This is a, a project that we just wrapped in Chicago. This was a full Stage 32 production where it was entirely casted, crewed, and financed through Stage 32. So what we did is we encouraged people to post on social media. Um, we had hashtags that went along with the movie, and all of a sudden we have built this groundswell of support for our film, and right now the film's in post, and so we've been 
must be my phone that's doing that, sorry. Um, and right now, what's great is we're not even, you know, the, the film's in the can, we're going through the edit right now, and we already have a, an army of support that can't wait to see it. So for us, you know, I, don't, I think we're probably going to do um, like a VOD release. I don't think we're going to attempt to do a limited theatrical. But for us, it's great because now all of a sudden we have hundreds of thousands of fans on this film, and that all came from us showing photos on set, and we did like little snippets of videos. I think we, uh, someone earlier was talking about doing um, little interviews with the cast and things like that. So that goes a really long way. But it's it's definitely altering opinions. So. But also, it's a tool. Unfortunately, like for continuity, people have their phones. For you know, some people will keep the call sheet and stuff on their phone. To, or you're checking the time, right? Because you have a watch and you're trying to stay on schedule. So, unfortunately, there's so many things now that we rely on with our phones. It's hard to make it. But I, I walked extras off set, like that would not listen to. Lee. I mean, we had Josh Lucas. He's a handsome guy, and everyone was like, "Oh, Josh Lucas, take a picture." And I was like, "Sorry." And after you tell him four times, you're like, "Escort them off set." Right. Yeah, because I know we, disturbances are also a consideration. Um, I asked because when you all were talking about scheduling and talking about printing off something, I wondered if you all didn't utilize the app, like calendar app or scheduling app that would notify the person that they were supposed to be at a specific location at a specific time, or is that something that just isn't common practice? I know in my first three films, we had no cell phone service. It was a nightmare. We were shooting in these remote locations where we didn't have cell phones. So we, there was not even an option. We were trying to find ways just to let people communicate when they got home. So I, I think you have to be very aware that you're going to be in a lot of areas where there are, there's not service. So to rely on that would completely shut your production down. I can also um, give an example for that. We were filming in Tobago, um, Mount Irvin. Uh, we had to be there for a week, and the internet the service was terrible. So every night we had to print the call sheets and kind of stick it under all of the doors of the rooms of everybody um, before we went to bed as the 80s. So it had to print, and we were, we had the, the of course the floor plan for the hotel. Of course, only the 80s had that access, and every night we had to like be slipping call sheets under the door mandatory because you can't rely on the cell phone, you can't rely on stuff, but they need to have the information so. It depends. <laughs> and we have had productions where we have emailed the stuff. Like somebody, you have the option to access a drop, or, or I know some there's certain apps that you can use. But I think it's you have to to use both ways just in case something goes yeah. wrong. Oh, no, I think there's oh, a question. Oh, good afternoon. Um, as one of my focus is documentaries, and um, I was wondering if there were any specific incidences that occurred that you could shed light on that proved to be difficult. And uh, I remember um, Amanda mentioned about someone coming on set and they had a beard and now they don't have a beard, but if you're doing interviews that may spread over, over a period, I mean, does it matter with a documentary so much if the person changes? Well, it has, I mean, uh, you're gonna sort of, den obviously the story of the documentary will denote that time has passed. There'll be something, it's not just because they have a beard or not beard, there'll be something that did that mark their hair is different two years later, I mean, there will probably be some type of, you know, graphic that promotes the story, why does this person look like this now? And that's probably part of your storytelling. So um, it's not just out of the blue, it's not from one shot to another and suddenly they change looks. Um, for me, the only issue I see maybe with a documentary is if the main person you're interviewing, uh, maybe they died or something happened where now your documentary is now compromised. Um, other than that, um, or maybe they would have said something that they weren't supposed to say and you didn't know that and then it went out there and somebody saying, well, you need to take that information um, off of your platform because they didn't maybe verify it or, or it's offensive. So I just think maybe just be careful with um, what persons are saying, do a fact check. Um, they might say somebody's a liar or a cheater, you don't know, and just, just fact check certain things 
um, before you actually put it out there um, in terms of documentaries. And I think as far as running, running smoothly as a blanket for documentary, the thing, um, I worked on documentary for HBO recently, and um, I don't normally work in that space. So I, one of the things that I really noted was you're, when you're talking to real people, there's a sensitivity. But you also, you know, if you're asking somebody to share their story, um, you, it's a little harder. Some, you have to be more on your feet because if someone has, let's say, agreed to go on camera, they could get cold feet the morning of the interview and decide that they're not, and it's going to change your entire schedule. Or, you know, let's say there's that one person that is super key to your story, and you've been talking to them, you know, over the course of like three or four months, and you're still, they're still kind of have cold feet, and they're not sure, but you go and you finally meet them. And they're like, oh my gosh, okay, you know what, you guys are cool, I trust you, I'm gonna tell you my story. You then probably wanna flip up everything you can in your schedule to get them on camera as soon as possible before they change their mind and they get cold feet again. So again, like there's this constant, like you have to be on your feet and be available to, um, to completely flip flop everything at the turn of the hat because you're not dealing with actors now. You're actually dealing with real people. And so I, I think that that was like one of the biggest like, oh, wow, this is like a completely different muscle as a producer. But it, to be as flexible as you can, I think, is, is the key to things running smoothly. Because when you're doing documentary, there's a trust because it's real people. And it's also important that this gossip we're talking about or these attitudes on set, like you can't have anything that's gonna make somebody who's about to share the most intimate part of their entire life that's gonna make them feel uncomfortable. So it's even more so to have this environment that allows them to feel comfortable so they can do that. Um, and as well, just one last thing with the documentaries. If you're interviewing maybe celebrities or persons who have a very busy schedule and you might be interviewing one person, you get a phone call saying, so and so is available now, can you all come? You have to find a way to then either <laughs> wrap that up and get to this other major interview. Um, you have to be able to be diplomatic. Um, courteous um, to be able to now end this one and then but that happens a lot because we got a lot of companies coming in during carnival dealing with if they have to interview Marshall or, or you know a lot of the celebrity performers and you see that happening a lot or if you have to catch the maybe the Cambly riot or something that's happening at this exact moment and we have to like okay we need to get so and so just is traffic is chaos is you have to weave through a fet. Um, to be able to be very flexible and um, to be able to capture what you need to at the drop of a hat. That happens too. Yeah, and actually, if I could add something to that too, you know, sometimes when you're filming documentary, um, we do have a lot of people who do documentary on stage 32. Um, I think we've talked throughout the day that sometimes the story that you're envisioning um, may go a complete different turn. Um, and so when you're capturing footage, you know, sometimes you need to realize that your subject might bring up something that's key to what will be your storyline, and let's say it's something that's in the past, and so you need to determine as a filmmaker, how are you visually going to tell that if that's not something that you can film? So, you know, will you have to create a reenactment shot, or are you going to have to find maybe some stock footage to convey the, um, you know, what the subject's trying to tell? So it's definitely a really interesting form of storytelling, and it's, uh, it's, it's not easy because it's, it can go any which way, but you know, definitely think about those things. My name is Oshe. Um, we do animation, so I just want to find out about the experience with live action and animation with any of the panels. If you have other experience with live animation, with live action and animation. I have any experience with that? Um, I do not. <laughs> I'm trying to Can you be more specific with your question? Just Okay, well, um, well, like when they CG in some of the sets, like, um, for example, um, we did an advertisement for UTT, I mean Unitrust, yeah. and it had a live action. And one of the things I recognized and I noticed to the panel, all the AG, ADs are um, mainly females. Um, is that a female role? Mainly, no, I was on two sets before, and mainly there are females in the roles. Also, I'm asking that I want to hear the experience between live action and animation. 
You understand the question? I, I'm not sure what you mean but by anim the, but animation doesn't, there's not, uh, do you mean like green screen? You mean like CGI? Yeah, CGI. Well, when I, anytime I've ever shot, I mean, a lot of my commercials, I use green screen or CGI. I always, the post company comes, they send me texts, come, so we shoot it properly, where we're, whether we're putting targets on the green screen or stuff like that. So um, you always have someone from the post company come to make sure that a it's lit you know it's it's simple things it's very easy to shoot green screen now it's, it's very easy to to um you know to, to replace images with green screen so um but usually you have texts that come just to make sure you're shooting the product or you're shooting the model or you're shooting whatever correctly you know what that that was that was my role and function with the um advertisement we did with Unitrust. Mm -hmm. So I was there on set to make sure, I mean, they go according to plan and etc. But I, w I didn't get the experience of the, the I, I wasn't knowledgeable about the, uh, the production that was going on around me because I was there for one thing only and it was to make sure it was going according to plan. So I just wanted to know the experience in terms of the challenges and the, the, the the advantages behind doing a production mm -hmm. with CGI. It, it's key. I think that you nailed it. Is if you don't bring someone in to supervise and make sure you're doing it correct from post, that scene might not ever be able to get used. So it, it's key. Whenever we are doing it, we always have somebody there as well. So it's a it's a post effect, and you're you're com you know you there's so many things that have effects or. VFX or special effects or in VR, you always have a bunch of techs with you, with the, the camera department to just make sure that it's it's done efficiently and properly and it's lit properly, basically, that you're not having any shadows or any weird spill or some green contamination or should, you know, are they on a, do, do we need to get them up off the floor so they're on a platform because you're going to have a problem like, um, it's not rotoscope anymore, but you're having a problem replacing imagery if they're flat on the floor on green. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's just technical. It's part of, part of the course. It's there's nothing really magical about it. Let's say. Well, and and I, admittedly, I don't have any experience in animation. However. Um, on stage 32. Um, no, but I'm, I'm serious. So, but but animation is its own animal. Yeah. It's its own animal, and and it, it it runs by different rules. And I'm learning that now um, because one of the educators that I just brought in, um, he's a director for the Netflix show Paradise PD, and so he's actually teaching a webinar next Saturday on directing animation, where he's going to kind of go over that side of the role that maybe you didn't really get to experience when you were on set, you know, with the green screen this last time. So, um, but what I do know is that it's, it, it does kind of run by its own rules. And, um, you know, we're, we're just bringing that education into stage 32. So hopefully you'll take advantage of it as, as one of your free webinars. I think that brings up something interesting that surprisingly we haven't touched on in our, our panels today is, um, the role of an editor and how effective it could be to have an editor on set while you're shooting. No, so well, for example, we had to go over the shoots like three or four times because the visuals, how it would look to animate it, it wouldn't add up with the shoot that they take. Now, it seems good yeah. on camera, but when you carry the footage to the studio, it's a different story. So that's why you, you mainly have to have somebody there on point that would have that vision or perspective on yeah. how it's supposed to be shot. Yeah, and, and we'll do that with narratives, is if you can, I mean, oftentimes the person that's editing it's the director or the the DP anyway, and then they have it in their mind. But if they're not, it is good to have an editor so that you make sure that you get everything you need, you've got all the perspective that things can be edited together. So before you all go home and everyone disperses, if you need to reshoot something or get something you missed, you can hopefully do it right away versus um, later. Mm -hmm. So that is a key thing we didn't talk about when we were talking about no, Because it up. caused a lot of conflict. Mm -hmm. Now, they were discussing about um, how they would lose money and all these different things. Mm -hmm. Now, to be quite honest, it's not affecting the studio or my job, but they keep going on and on about it and they still wanted to send it forward because that was their vision and their perspective. But it just wouldn't have worked in the studio. So it had like a whole big dialogue back and forth. 
the same thing when it was discussing before and it had people had to talk to people put people to the side and all these different things so it was i mean um i just want to ask a question did you all see the script before um the yeah. day of filming yeah well we did the animatic we didn't see the script before but right. we did the animatic so we had to go by the animatic that we did. Right. So that was we did. And when you got and said they wanted to change what yes, you all were suggesting. Exactly because the shot was already took and taken and they wanted to change. They, they didn't want to change it around and yeah. time, money, we losing sunlight because it was outside in the sun, sunlight going and all these different things. So it was becoming all of this you back and forth. And you mentioned with the AD you wanted to find out why would the so who was determining to end the filming? Was it the AD? To the be director? Honest, to be honest I learned about that role today. But what I recognize <laughs> <laughs> what I recognize is the main the mainly I've been on to and I've been on a music video also. Mm. The eighties is mainly be females. For some reason. But why no, is I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, like, that's a I don't have a problem I don't have a problem with it. But I just would love to hear a man perspective on the AD, on the AD um, role and functions because but it's. They're gonna tell you the same exactly thing. the same. Th I've I've worked globally with men and women globally. The men and the are the, the same as the women. I've had male ads on big fashion shoots jump in the shower with the model. She's in you know because they have to get her hair. They put the shampoo in her hair and they're doing her hair so she can have the shampoo so when the water comes in and the Dove shampoo goes down, it looks sexy. But it's a guy and he's AD and he's going to do it because the hair and makeup are off with the other four models. You know, like it's, it's this, there's no, literally, there's no male, female thing in any, especially in the AD department. I've only worked with male ADs. Every film's been a male AD, so. Now, from my perspective is I work on, I work on two film productions. I saw females and then I came and I see four females on the panel. So I had to ask the question that if it was it a mainly a female role. No, it's no, not. No, no, it's not. Not at all. Not even, uh, it wouldn't even be a, something I would even think about. I don't think there's any career position that I would say is a male or a female role. I, yeah. There's not a single, there is not a single position outside of actor in actor actress because it's needed for the role that's the only time that that even gender plays into it i mean it might be I, you're I, lifting a lot of heavy I shit you know i hired so at the short film we did we had a female it was an all-female female crew groups. an entirely female crew and that was mm -hmm. done on purpose because it dealt with hashtag me too movement and um our our camera department our g and e was all women and the gaffer from that project i brought on to the the hbo project that i did and the men on set were like, it, it, some of them had never worked with a female gaffer before. And what was so cool is they were like, oh, this is cool. Like, I've never worked with a female gaffer. And I'll, I'll never forget the moment where our DP was like, she was like on set for five minutes and we, after we were shooting. And I remember him going, like, she rocks. Like, good. <laughs> and she, she, but she's she just doing her job. job. She's yeah. doing her job. Like, there was no difference between a male or a female. So. No, and it really isn't. And it, it's not even like a, that's why we're so like, <laughs> you know, it's not even occur to us to think in male or female roles anymore. It never, unless it's, I've been forced to use, we're not happy when we do, because I've done it union, and we're like, okay, it's like a two day, you know, to do sort of a celebrity shoot, and they're like, but we want all female, and we're like, where are we a week before finding a, the level of key grip female that we want? She's wanted everywhere. Like, are you kidding me? Like, that's yeah. such a, so sometimes it's a little, shoved in for you know we'd rather i'd rather have the quality talent whether they're f male female a midget i don't care <laughs> if, they, if they're good at what they do exactly, yeah. bring yeah. it okay. on yeah. i just want to i think maybe with your question or say he's like o'shea um with the 80 maybe because because uh, if you don't mind sharing who afterwards <laughs> um ideally you guys should have been there before the filming of that whole process took place um, and it would have maybe been a scheduling concern. So if you were there in advance, then you could have then been right there guiding the process so that when you all arrive, it wouldn't be a matter of they filmed it incorrectly. So next time, tell them that you need to be there before um, to go through just you know final checks to make sure everything is in place to deal with that whole um, time situation, to try doing that. Yeah. Cool. Also, I mean, I've had live switching. I've had, you know, you, 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 that's where you pay them more money. You get, you can live do it. Right. I've done it with VR where it's the, you live can see it, but it takes more manpower, more equipment, you know, more money. things, yeah. money.
to get to that level of where you're sure you have it because you're looking at it through the headset. Any more questions? Hi everyone, uh, I am Willie. Uh, my question would be, have you um, any experience um, with children on set and the psychological part with dealing with horror films and thrillers, <coughs> etc., and how you handle um, the situation? Specifically with horror films? Yeah. <coughs> I've only done happy-go-lucky commercials with children, so, so they seem quite happy, and children actors are great because they're very astute, and you sort of just do it in, you, you have less hours, because at least in America there's <coughs> set rules, and you just, um, it depends what the scene is and what you need to, for them to, to deliver to you, but it's less, say, psychological verbiage from the director and it's more um what's what's the reaction i want you know and how do you get to that reaction so it's result more result directing than guiding them to an a uh, like an emotional response that you want to come inherently from the talent and i think parents too i i've worked with kids a lot but not on i would say a horror film um Although, from some perspectives, it could have been a horror film. <laughs> but on screen, they, they don't look like that. Um, and I think that that's where also we rely on the parents. Like, if the parents, if this kid has done a lot of work, I felt like the parents know how to talk them through, like, understanding if they've done a lot. Like, they understand the difference between reality and uh, fiction and, and are able to kind of, like, separate the two. So... I'm only done happy films with children, so I can't answer that as well. Right. Sorry. <laughs> um, I had one of my educators who did a uh, really messed up, <laughs> like psychological horror thriller, and um, we screened his short film in our Stage 32 short film program. And some of the advice that that he actually, or some of the advice that he talked about, is if there's an adult that's on set or key part of the the film. Um, having the the adult and the child have a bonding relationship outside of um, just shooting the scenes together so there's a trust factor between the adult and the child um, and then the other thing that uh, he shared was really taking time the director he, as the director he took time with the kid to truly separate um, what was like he called it like play um, you know play with um, the props and with the stuff and made sure that the kid could touch the the knife with the blood and all of that so they knew that it wasn't real and then he drew um, I can't believe I remember all of this actually and then he drew the um, the emotions from the child on things that the child uh, was dealing with in, in his own life so I can't remember exactly what he said but I think it was like you know, have you ever been bullied before? You know, how that made you feel? Like, you know, were you angry or were you scared? Um, and then he had the, the child pull from that emotion. So it was really from, like, that the child's personal connection versus, like, the fact that in the film he had a, you know, like a, a knife, you know, kind of going after him. So um, I'll, I don't know if we have the footage of him talking about that, but hopefully that's helpful a little bit. Uh, what about um, like after the film or during um, scenes, and they have it's it's been played psychologi psychologically in the the mind of the child, and it affects like like they're getting scared in a sense. Well, that's not our problem. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they they did get hired on as an actor. Um, you know, and, and, and they, they, the parents have read the script, yeah. everybody's vetted the thing. Yeah. What their, my responsibility sort of ends when they leave set. And as, as a producer, mm -hmm. I will say that you also need to, when anyone's doing an emotional scene, is make sure that, like, give people the time mm -hmm. to yeah. prepare and to recover and don't immediately, like, throw them into something else, like, right away. Like, there are ways, I think, to schedule to allow the parents <laughs> <laughs> give it to the parents, but allow the parents to to work through whatever they have to work through. I think um, mm -hmm. space is always good for any actor when needed. And you can always put in the contract too. Um, you know, if you're concerned that you know maybe the the parent agrees to not let the child watch the film when it's completed, 
you know, you could put that in the contract. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. well, hopefully, the parents you would hope in some cases too would m shield shield them. So, yeah, I would think so. Um, I know that there was a question in the back. Hi, my name is Mina. I'm um, a producer, an animation producer at Full Circle Animation here in Trinidad. And I would like to know when it comes to VR filmmaking, um, there are certain like ideas, um, formulas, um, rules that are you know, used in traditional filmmaking versus you know, filmmaking for VR. I would like to know like, what are some of the challenges on set? When it, you know, when you have to like diverge into from traditional into filmmaking for VR. Well, it's a totally different mindset. It's it's not. There's no comparison um, except for that you have a crew and you have talent. Um, but you, it's it's a very post heavy process. So as I was saying to someone else, the, it's t t VR and the v and VR is going to AR, going to XR, going to different types of. Um, uh, platforms because it depends how, what your camera setup is, it depends what lenses you're using, it depends how you're moving that camera, which they can do a lot more now. But it is a three, it's like directing theater, it's not like directing film, you're directing in a sphere, or you, it, typically, so you can, so the audience can turn their heads everywhere. So just as like directing theater, you're using choreography, you're using sound design, you're using your lighting. You also have to figure out what you know level is. Can I get rid of all my stands and my grip equipment and all that in post with all the cleanup so the lighting, you know, uh, can work? But I mean, it, it, it's there's magical things you do in post, and and part of VR is the the, the least amount of almost the least amount of time is spent in the actual shooting of it and the actual moving of the talent. Most of it is capturing that so it can be manipulated. And typically, you have lots of techs on set with you at the same time doing it. Um, they do do lower budget stuff, but um, uh, I think the cameras are getting better and better. Um, and, and you're able to move those cameras. It doesn't just have to plop it right there in the center and just and and do a three. Because I'm not a big fan of 360, honestly. But um, I don't know if that answered your question. It's it's you can't really compare it. Well, where would most of the work go towards, like, pre-production or post-production? Well, the work always goes into the reproduction. Most of it will. So it's and all your more work similar. It's similar to traditional, you know, filmmaking style where... Well, your, your post is where all your money is going. Uh, let, you can... I mean, it depends on how big a show you're doing, but um, most of your money is going into the post because of you have an array of you know 12 cameras with that amount of match of footage that's going and how do you align those up and you know it's just there's so many details to doing it properly um, so that's that's where you're you're spending your money okay no well I I'm so but I'm talking about like when it comes to time which one would take the most amount of time pre-production it's well, time, doing, I know that time the, the, I, that is very specific yeah. toward, <laughs> towards a jo to any job. Mm -hmm. um, because so it, it doesn't make a difference much. I mean, it does make a difference, but at the same time, a lot of time would go into making um, the pre-production of a VR and the well, pre-production But you're doing a lot more previs. You're yeah. doing lots of previs. You're doing, you have clients. I mean, when we're talking about a real, like a real job with a real bl uh, budget over a million dollars for a VR project or whatever we're doing with that, there's previs, there's sign-offs, there's, there's multiple layers of um, working with people who are doing VR now or doing it at sort of a higher level where they're having more funding come in there's a lot of pre-production that happens, but then your whole post is you have to, how do you edit these things? Because you have to edit in headsets. And so that takes an enormous amount of time to do that. Um, so it's not, it's, it's not as streamlined as, say, um, the, the film industry is, because the film industry has been around for 200 years. This is a new, it's a, t a new medium, so you don't really try to mesh it together. You don't compare them. Okay, so the, so... Would you say, like, at this moment in time, there's no really set rules when it comes to 
um, filmmaking for VR or you know um, or in 360. There's no, no set. There's, there's, there's no not set because rules. people are taking a lot of stuff from gaming and, and how you shoot gaming and how you you um, you know put on body cameras and you uh, it just it's just totally different and you approach it in a different method methodology or it depends where the tech is at because stuff that was out last year is antiquated right. as far as cameras go. I have a question because I'm I don't do VR. But if you were to ask me about a standard production indie, um, I would say you know six to eight weeks for a prep, one month to shoot, and within six months we'll have all the posts done, and we're gonna wrap for two weeks. Like th that's pretty standard. Mm -hmm. Is there any kind of like standard timeline? No, it's all. Because you're the not door. doing features, per se. No one's gonna be necessarily in a headset or thing. That, that hasn't. It doesn't translate to that. Yeah, got it. So it translate to specialty things. Are we shooting? Are we gonna see it in a dome? Like. Every single project is its sort of a yeah. unique thing, and because VR is actually going out, it's not the thing anymore because the the tech in the headsets hasn't caught up. They're too expensive, so you need a, such a big engine to play the heavier tech pieces. We're looking into you know that's why AR has come so popular, and then there's you know XR. There's different just you've got to follow where the tech's going, basically and how to make it. Okay, we wrap it up. All right, guys, we're going to have to wrap it up. Um, so before we leave, uh, a resource for everybody here in the room. Yeah. Well, Stage 32. We love Stage 32. They're the almost awesomeness. You can find anything there. Um, another thing that one of my favorite things to do is to read American Cinematographer um, because you get not only the DPs, you know, how they made it. I mean, there are sort of fluff pieces, but you get the technical on what is the equipment used to make the thing, what, um, what are sort of the challenges they went through, and it's just really interesting. What are the cameras doing that they're using now? I was, I was, I have a subscription. I have one too. Um, I'd recommend a, there's a platform called Basecamp and that really helps when you go into production. It's a way for the entire cast and crew to stay connected. So if there's different mm -hmm. files or shot lists or any photos, um, footage, everybody can dump it all into Basecamp and you can communicate um, on chat and also just share files that way. I, f I feel like the resources that we've been talking yeah, about over the last, yeah. yeah are the, you guys get the passes on this one. Yeah. You guys get passes. You've been at this all day. So you guys, a, a huge round of applause for these lovely ladies. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Thank you guys.